Hi everyone, today I'm going to be talking about the case of Mary Ann Verdici. Now, first of all, let me say I apologize ahead of time for mispronunciation of names, places, or anything else. I try my best, but sometimes it's hard to figure out how to pronounce these, especially in this case where the name is usually said with a Spanish or Italian accent, neither of which I have. I decided to talk about this case for a couple of reasons. First of all, my parents actually sent me this article out of the newspaper to read because they know I find this type of stuff interesting. And then I realized that this actually happened not only very close to where we live, but it happened in my dad's neighborhood during the time he was living there and growing up. And he recalls that it was just the talk of the city. At the time, it was known as Pittsburgh's biggest missing persons case. Marianne Verdici was born on August 15th, 1951, and she went missing at just 10 years old on June 7th, 1962 from Bloomfield, PA. She was only 10 at the time of her disappearance. And that is actually another reason I wanted to cover this in honor of her birthday. Marianne's childhood was less than perfect. In 1957, Marianne's parents decided to separate, and in turn, they actually sort of abandoned her with her aunt, Ruth Riley, and Ruth's children, Marianne's cousins. So Marianne had lived with her aunt, Ruth Riley, from 1957 until her disappearance. Now, Marianne was said to be this very free-spirited little girl. She liked to go from place to place. She liked to wander around the neighborhood. She didn't mind being on her own. But she also loved to play with her neighborhood friends and if she wasn't wandering from place to place on her own, she was playing with the local neighborhood children. And it is sad because a lot of people refer to her as the child that just wanted to be loved because they said that she just craved love and affection so badly that if you showed her any type of attention or any type of affection that she would just really cling to you and you would become one of her best friends. Now, Marianne attended the Roman Catholic school called the Immaculate Conception. And on June 7th, she only had a half day of school because it was the last day of school before summer break. So it is said that she got home somewhere around 12.30 that day and changed out of her school uniform and into her play clothes. And then she decided to go out and enjoy the rest of her day. So this is where I started to read slightly different accounts. Neither are far off from one another. One just has slightly more detail. So I'm going to go ahead and just tell you the one with slightly more detail. And that is when Marianne left her house around 1230, she went to a fellow playmate's house to ask if they could come out and play with her, but she was informed by their parents that they were ill and they unfortunately could not play. So from there, Marianne decided to go visit someone she visited quite often, and that was Miss Jean Emery. Now, Jean lived in an apartment building called the Martinique. On Marianne's way to the Martinique, she passed a local bar called the Belvedere, and she waved to the owner who was in the window. And the owner just figured that Marianne was going to see Miss Emery because she did that so often, and she was right. That is where Marianne was headed. So Marianne got to Miss Emery's apartment, and she went in and visited her and played with the cat. And while she was there, Miss Emery asked her to please go to the store for her and pick up some cat food. It's unclear why Miss Emery needed someone to run errands for her, as she was only in her early to mid twenties. So maybe. Marianne was just looking for a way to earn some extra cash, or maybe she just didn't mind doing favors and it kept her busy. Either way, Marianne happily agreed to go to the store for Jean and left and went to the grocery store to get some cat food. When Marianne returned, it was said to be about 2.45 p.m. And now again, we're going to run into an area where there has been conflicting information. So I'm going to just go ahead and tell you guys all the versions that I have read because I don't know how to decipher which one is the correct one. The most popular one I read was that Marianne arrived back to the Martinique around 2.45 p.m. And she went up to give Jean the cat food but was told by the apartment manager, William Dozier, that Ms. Emery was no longer home. 
and Marianne was last seen by William Dozier headed towards home. Another version I've heard is that Marianne entered the apartment building and went up to Ms. Emery's apartment and the janitor saw Marianne try the doorknob and knock and Ms. Emery was no longer home and that was the last time that Marianne was seen. And many other versions are very similar to those two but basically saying that she was seen going into the apartment building at 245 and she was never seen coming out. So with the case this old it's really hard to find exact information and most of the things I see are the same article just rewritten and rewritten and rewritten so it doesn't give me much to go on but those are the different accounts that I have read. Regardless of which account is 100% accurate the one thing that is known is that the last known sighting of Marianne was around 2.45 p.m. on June 7th. By 6 p.m. that day when Mary hadn't returned home, her family began searching for her and they called the police at 10.30 p.m. that evening when no trace of her was to be found. Mary Ann Verdici was born on August 15, 1951. She went missing from Bloomfield, PA on June 7, 1962 at the age of 10. At the time of her disappearance, Mary Ann was 4 foot 10 60 pounds. She was wearing a white blouse with red shorts and white sneakers. Marianne has black hair, brown eyes, and a scar in the center of her forehead. If you have any information on the case of Marianne, please contact Pittsburgh Police Bureau at 412-323-7800. Agency case number 62744. Thank you. Unfortunately, even after filing a missing persons report, they never came across Marianne that day or the following days. However, a few days after Marianne's disappearance, they did discover a bracelet that was believed to be hers right at the entrance of the Highland Park Zoo, which is now known as the Pittsburgh Zoo. When this bracelet was discovered, it sent off a massive search party throughout the zoo. But unfortunately, no other traces of Marianne were discovered. Now, this bracelet was one that could be purchased at the dime store, as they say. Um, it was faux pearls, and I believe it had a little um, heart charm on it, if I'm not mistaken. And it could have belonged to any young girl, really. But it was confirmed by all Marianne's friends and family that Marianne had that exact bracelet. And then when police did an inventory of all of Marianne's belongings, that bracelet was nowhere to be found. So it is strongly believed that that bracelet was Marianne's. The biggest question is, was that bracelet lost there before or after her disappearance? And that is something We'll never know. The police's first suspicion was that Marianne's mother, Marilyn Riley, came back and kidnapped her daughter. So the first order of business was to find Marianne's mother. They ended up finding Marilyn Riley in Chicago and they brought her back to Pittsburgh for questioning. They also found Marianne's father. The two were not together as mentioned they had separated in 1957. However, the police located them both and brought them both back to Pittsburgh for questioning in this case. They both maintained their innocence and swore that they had not seen Marianne since they separated in 1957 and they left her to live with her aunt. So they both agreed to take a polygraph test and the police performed a polygraph test on both Marianne's mother and father and they both passed the polygraph test, so they were both ruled out as suspects. Unfortunately, both Marianne's mother and father are now deceased. Now, another thing that is frustrating about researching older cases is that I didn't find anywhere if they interviewed, I mean, I'm sure they obviously did interview her, but I didn't find any more details about anything that Jean Emery said. I didn't find any more details about the apartment manager or was he the janitor or who exactly he was, but William Dozier. So I'm assuming that the police followed up with those two leads and they led nowhere because basically after they found Marianne's parents and ruled them out as suspects, the case pretty much went nowhere. That was until 1991 when a man now grown came forward and said that through psychiatric counseling, he was able to remember something terrible he witnessed as a child in 1962 at the age of nine. He claims that he saw a Presbyterian minister molest and kill a young girl. 
He also claimed that Reverend Robert Buchanan molested him as a young boy. And with that being said, the police went and questioned the Reverend himself. The Reverend denied all allegations and held fast to his innocence. And he was never charged in the disappearance of Marianne. Even though Reverend Buchanan maintained his innocence, the police decided to go ahead and dig up five acres of land around Baldwin United Presbyterian Church. Of course, they were looking for Marianne's remains or anything else suspicious, but they found nothing. Something else I'd like to talk about before the end of this video is the apartment building, the Martinique. Now, if you remember, the Martinique is the apartment building where Jean Emery lived and Marianne visited frequently. Now, this building, there's just kind of like an air of suspicion around it because it was this five-story apartment building on Baum Boulevard in Bloomfield, PA. And everyone, well, I shouldn't say everyone, a lot of people say that it has since been demolished and it is gone. However, residents of Bloomfield and the surrounding area will tell you differently. That building was never demolished. A building next to it was demolished and a small pizza shop was added to the front of this apartment building. But this apartment building itself was never demolished. It was simply changed from the Martinique apartments to the Boulevard apartments and it still stands to this day. That is what I truly believe because if you look at some of the images of the building then and now it is the same building other than the little addition in the front of it. It is eerily the same building and not just does the construction look the same but the building that is there now is older it's not some newer type building. It obviously looks like an old building. I also noticed in some of the photos, and I will try to include as many as possible, however the photos are few and far between and the ones I can find are not of great quality. However, I even noticed the windows, if you look, there's a pattern with larger windows and smaller windows with the Martinique, and that pattern still remains there today with the Boulevard apartments. So a lot of people basically believe that these this apartment building was never torn down. It was simply renamed to try to mask its background. And its background, you may be wondering, what is that other than Marianne's disappearance? And unfortunately, this was just not a good place to reside. There was a lot of prostitution, a lot of drugs. Two or three years before Marianne's murder, another woman went missing from this building. However, she was 30, so people really don't think the two are related since Marianne was only 10. However, I think it's kind of suspicious. And both before and after Marianne's disappearance, this building was just really not a great place to be. There was just a lot of illegal activity going on. So a lot of people believe that this building simply was never demolished and that is just some type of tall tale that is going around. All it was done was renamed. What makes this theory even more plausible is the fact that if you go to look at records for this building now, no original records exist on when it was built or anything like that. So I think that is all very strange and I think that building itself is hiding something or at least hiding its past. One thing I should also mention is that Marianne has a half-brother. Now she never got to meet this half-brother. However, he is a grown man now and he works in Chicago as a police officer and he was inspired by Marianne's case. He has been to the Bloomfield area and he has talked to the detective that was on Marianne's case. Even though that detective is since retired, she is still very adamant about finding out what happened to Marianne. And this man and the detective both continue to keep Marianne's memory alive and still strive to this day to figure out what really happened to Marianne that day. Well guys, that is pretty much the case of Marianne Verdici. And again, I apologize for any mis mispronunciations of any words or places. Um, it's sad. August 15th was her birthday, so in honor of her birthday and keeping her memory going, I wanted to post this video on August 15th. 
And this is just a really sad case, especially when you consider the nuns at her school saying that she just wanted to be loved. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to this case. And I know it's an older one, but I don't think that anyone deserves to be forgotten. So thank you for taking the time to listen and learn about Marianne and her disappearance.